honored to be here with you because the Women's Intercultural Network has really been a great partner at the United Nations. And it is no exaggeration to say that organizations like WIN are what really make the United Nations stronger. So thank you very much for your efforts in doing that. <clears throat> So Women's Equality Day, Women's Equality Day reminds us that I believe in 1920, women in the United States first won the right to vote. And I also believe that it is 29 years after New Zealand got the right to vote. But what matters is not the date that we won our right, but what we do with that right and how we exercise it. A few weeks ago, I was in Surabaya, Indonesia, and I met a woman who's affectionately called Risma, who the Washington, the Washington Huffington Post has called Indonesia's great secret. And she really did the impossible because she was one of the first elected women mayors in the largest Muslim country in the world. Risma, a few days after she was elected, she's an architect, she began to change the wastelands of Surabaya into parks. And that transformed the lives of everyone in that city. Lights went up in dark and very dangerous streets. And music began to be played in the public parks. One night, I was walking along the river, and I saw women with young babies, uh, teenagers, and old people all clapping to a popular band. And one man turned to me, and he said, she has changed our lives. We feel like we're living in a new era. So <clears throat> I was in Surabaya for a meeting which was in preparation for a UN meeting called Habitat 3. That meeting is on urban settlements and housing. And during that meeting, a young leader turned to me and said, why are you so excited about the CEDAW? And I thought about that long afterwards <clears throat> and about my relationship to that particular Treaty. As you know, that is a legally binding international uh, treaty that is now ratified by 189 countries. I actually first read CEDAW 35 years ago when I was serving as a member of the Secretariat for the Second World Conference on Women in Copenhagen. I remember thinking why do we need a new policy document when this particular document seems to cover everything that we need to cover? It covers political, economic, social, cultural, civil rights. And Article 7, by the way, guarantees all women the right to vote. Article 13 guarantees the right to family benefits, bank loans, mortgages, credit, as well as the right to participate in sports. And most important, that treaty requires governments to prevent discrimination as well as provide remedies. So in addition to what we have in that elegant text called CEDAW, we have a committee of 23 members, they're called the CEDAW Committee, who act a little bit like judges who interpret the law for governments and to whom governments report. They also issue what we call general recommendations, and so far they've done 34 of them. These general recommendations are a little like amendments to the treaty. They cover areas where they feel there was not enough understanding about what governments should be reporting. The one that you have spoke about in the previous panel really covers violence against women, which was not covered so well in the original text. Gen general recommendation number 30, which I followed and um, 
and participated in discussions and dialogues about is the one on women in conflict prevention, during conflict and post-conflict situations, the kinds of protections that we can now call upon to help the girls of Boko Haram. The committee has also made an important statement on climate change. And I'd like to read you a part of that statement because it's a very important um, sanctioning of the committee on our role in it. From CEDAW's examination of states' parties' reports, it is apparent that climate change does not affect women and men in the same way and has a gender differentiated impact. However, women are not just helpless victims of climate change. They are powerful agents of change and their leadership is crucial. What surprised me was that that Copenhagen conference, none of the governments it seemed shared my enthusiasm for that treaty. In fact, most of them pretty much ignored it and put it away in the shelves of their government offices after they signed. But a lot has changed since then. The once obscure treaty, along with this Beijing Platform for Action that um, many of you participated in helping to shape, have become the gold standards for what we understand to be the policy guidance and the legal guidance for gender equality and women's empowerment. So by now you know I have become a quack lawyer. I'm an anthropologist by training, not a legal expert. But I think I'm totally in love with this role. And I would love to have you become a quack lawyer as well. Because I think if all of us took some of these well-written UN treaties, understood them better, and helped to make that translation for our communities and our cities, we would see a lot of change happen very fast. Most urgently in this election year, can a woman become president of the United States? So what brought CEDAW to life? What made CEDAW a part of this conversation on elections? The answer is you, the feminist and women's movements, along with and working with governments and with members of the CEDAW committee. The really, really good news is that this Cities for CEDAW campaign is once again breathing new life into this treaty. So what is this campaign? A lot of you in this room probably can explain it as well as I can. But I wanted to share with you my own experience with it and my own sense of what it means to me. When I look at the issues that the UN is grappling with today, I think the number one issue for our entire world is climate change. If we don't get that right, we are going to to unravel so much progress that we've made in the areas of equality and development and peace. So our Cities for CEDAW campaign has to keep that vision. And we do have to get gender equality and women's rights there to create a much more resilient and vibrant democracy because it is democracies that is going to help move this agenda to its right place. And why should we be hopeful? Because Dear San Francisco in 1998 adopted CEDAW as a city ordinance, meaning that it was legally binding. It was a wonderful moment in UN history because it was the first time that a UN treaty had ever become legally binding at the city level. And using that leverage, dramatic changes were made in how the city evaluated the impact of public spending on women's welfare, gender stereotyping in public works and transport, and the most important part of the climate change equation. And gender balance in the fire and police departments became possibilities. As many of you know, between 1998 and 2013, other cities including Los Angeles and Berkeley, 
as well as the state of California, and we hope the state of Oregon, enacted similar initiatives. Then in 2015, when I was chair of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women in New York, we collaborated with the Mayor's Office of San Francisco, the San Francisco Department on the Status of Women with Dr. Emily Marassi and Marilyn Fowler of WIN to launch a Cities for CEDAW campaign in the United States. As, <laughs> as part of his commitment, to this campaign, imagine our surprise when we learned that Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles issued an, an executive directive on CDAO in 2015. Part of this was a five-part report that was laying the basis, the, the picture of what Los Angeles looked like in its leadership, women and veterans, education, and women in the workforce, and public safety. And that executive director on CEDAW created a gender equity coalition powered by the Commission on the Status of Women in New York. He is my hero at this point. <laughs> so here in California, we know that other cities are moving. And um, you will forgive me if I do not mention your particular effort. But I would like to congratulate Irvine, Santa Barbara, Santa Monica, as well as Orange County, for your grassroots work in this campaign. You join Ashland and Eugene in Oregon, Kansas City, Louisville, New York City, Pittsburgh, Sarasota, Washington, D.C., Miami-Dade County, Wake County, and many more other initiatives at different levels who are moving in the direction of San Francisco and Los Angeles. I can also add from my own meetings with city officials, Reykjavik in Iceland, Port of Spain, Trinidad, Tobago, Taiwan, and also Vienna of Austria are interested in this campaign. We need and we appreciate you all. I love this campaign. First of all, I love it because it shows that city officials, when they work together with the women's movement, come up with very, very creative ideas on how to make the UN relevant to what's happening locally. Secondly, I like it because it requires us, members of the feminist, and I say feminist to include men, like many uh, of you who are married to really great feminist men, and the women's movement to answer really tough questions, which means that when we advocate for CEDAW, we also have to understand it more deeply and learn to defend it as well and find its gaps if there are any. And the third reason I love this campaign is because it shows to the world that a human rights instrument passed in some hall of some big building can actually be a useful tool for changing people's lives and you can measure that change. And I think it is a wonderful connection. In this case, it can happen in a country that has not even ratified CEDAW. The US is one of five which has not ratified. President Carter did sign, which is wonderful but the US is one of five that has not ratified. So my takeaway from this experience is that UN treaties are definitely more than international law. They establish the floors of standards of governance, but they should also provide ethical guidelines for corporations and for citizens. They bring the weight of global consensus with them, and they tie us to global accountability mechanisms. So making CEDAW legally binding at, evil, at any level actually makes expert interpretations of committees like the CEDAW committee available to us. And I invite you to go online and read some of their judgments because they are available to you. The naysayers in many countries complain that this is interference in our domestic laws. And I have to say, this makes our good laws better. There's also a political payoff, which I want to show, uh, share with you. 
um, at the National Mayor's Conference in San Francisco, one mayor sat down next to me and said, why should I sign CEDA? I said, well, I'll give you one reason. I said, no woman in that city is going to be mad at you. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, that women's groups that wants new, better public daycare, and then there's the group that wants better health care. There's the group that's, that really wants the city to act on equal pay for equal work. And there's the group that feels as though they've been discriminated against because of their religion at some bank. You are going to be able to tell them, I care about your issue, and I have something in hand that is going to address all of your demands. So he laughed, and then he thought about it, and he looked at me, and he said, you are absolutely right. So I feel as though change is coming very fast. But we need to set our benchmarks much higher. The challenge of climate change is a very urgent feminist and women's movement issue. If the voices of women and girls are not heard in every small town and in every megacity of this world, we are not going to be able to save our planet in time. It's a matter of scale and it's a matter of speed. Exercising our right to vote and our political voice is the key. And we are on the wildest roller coaster ride in human history because we cannot predict where this ride is going to end. So I am a practitioner of yoga in the morning for exercise. So deep breathing helps. But so does knowing that you're in really good company and looking around here in this room and sharing our space with our friends in San Francisco. I feel as though I personally am with really great people. So I would like to invite you all to join in an event which we hope to host the early part of October, which will be our second national virtual conference on cities for CEDAW. And with that, I would like to thank Wynne once more for the award I have to receive, which I'm going to be <laughs> happy to see very soon. Uh, to our friends in San Francisco for your support for Cities for CEDAW, and for, to all of you, to all of you for being my personal inspiration. Thank you. <laughs>